Hello, hello, hello. How is everyone doing today? I'm sorry I'm a little late. I'm actually at my parents' home in North Carolina. I'm sitting in the general's library. My dad's library. Um, let's go this way. Um, okay, Julia's ready. Thank you. Um, so this book, as you guys can see, Man's Search for Meaning has very, it's been very different than any of the books we've read. Um, you know what, Rita? Thank you. My grandma said I looked really good too. So I appreciate that. <laughs> We're on to, oh, I, uh, I put out a tweet or a message yesterday saying that we were going to do it at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time because that's the time I was living in. Sorry, at Pacific Standard, I live in L.A. most of the time. I'm in North Carolina right now. My mom brought me breakfast. It was great. Um, no hat today. No hat today. Okay, so let's just dive right in because this book is extremely interesting. I want to I wanna know, first off, what are, what are your first thoughts of this book, like what? What are your? I just want to. I'm going to read out loud your first thoughts. I feel like I'm back in Psychology 101. Okay, very cool, very cool. My book has two prefaces, and I read one of them, and I want to read the other one after I've read the whole book. Okay, cool. Um, I'm getting so confused at times. I'm sorry, Annie Hansen. That won't happen again. Well, it might, but we'll, we'll get through it. All right, loving the stash. I'm cool with this. Yeah, my book also had two introductions. It has the nineteen, the preface to the 1992 edition, and then the uh, the original forward. Well, not the original forward, the forward by Harold Kushner. Um, interesting. Oh, we have a test tomorrow. Well, good luck on the test tomorrow. Crush it. Couldn't read the book for today because I have my finals tomorrow on The Great Gatsby. Oh, we could read that one time. Great book. Um, Beautiful book. I was hooked instantly. Awesome. Interesting. Pulls my attention immediately. Shocking, but great. This is the kind of book I would never, ever read without input. This kind of topic is a challenge for me. Oh, can you expand on that? Milrelia. Sorry. <laughs> can you expand on that? Um, it looked a bit familiar to me as if I've read it before. Interesting. If you have, if you haven't, even more interesting. <laughs> Wow, I didn't know it was right now. I thought I went there and then finished the part. Yeah, oh, I'm so sorry. I read it last year. Had to make an essay based on psychology since that's what I'm studying. It was amazing. Okay, well, the cab, then I expect a lot of awesome insights from you. I started reading this book in college, put it down for a week, lost it, moved, found it, and was like, oh, I need to read that again. So um, I'm glad we're reading it again. Um, heavy stuff. Loving the book so far. Really interesting and thought evoking. Uh, mine had no introduction in this, and this time I read it not like the notes on A Handmaid's Tale. Ah, yeah, I know, right? I, introductions are tricky. Sometimes you read an introduction to a book, and it's a great entrance into the world of that book, and sometimes you read an introduction to a book, and it ruins the whole book. Slaughterhouse-Five, Lord of the Flies. Okay, that is a very cool parallel. Uh, Lord of, uh, to me, Slaughterhouse-Five makes more sense because he does become a prisoner of war. During the same war that Viktor Franco was uh, in a concentration camp, so that's that's not far off. I want to be part of this book club because I love to read, but it's hard. And I live in Sweden. Whoa, you'd be our, I don't know if our first Swedish fan, you'd be one of our Swedish fans. That'd be super cool. You totally should. One of our Swedish members. Sorry, not fans. We're all members here. It wasn't something you usually pick up, but I'm glad to have this be the first book I started with here. Cool. Stayed up all night when I started it. That's what I like to hear. Another friend asked me how it was for me reading this book being German. Okay. Annie. Hmm. What is that like? If you don't mind. This is, remember, this is all a discussion. This is cool. I have things I want to say, but I'm, I'm, this book especially, I want to see what everyone's kind of picking up. What people are, what you guys are thinking. What, what, how you guys are experiencing this interesting firsthand account from a psychologist. You know, maybe I should do this first. Um, what was I going to do? Oh, I was going to talk a little bit about Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a psychiatrist and neurologist in, um, I think he's from Vienna. He's German. And let me just look him up. I'm supposed to have this ready. Sorry, guys. It's 
It's crazy being home. Another fan, uh, maybe it looks familiar because we read the diary of Anne Frank. Okay, also. Um, Austrian neurologist and psychiatrist as well as a Holocaust survivor. He survived uh, Theresienstadt, Auschwitz, Koffering, and Turkheim. He was the founder of logotherapy, therapy, was a form of existential analysis. That is what the second part of the book about is about. It's more about logotherapy and his kind of discovery of, you know, the first half is us learning about this discovery and the second half of his, like, putting it to paper. Um, wow, Eddie Hansen. Interesting. So what is that like? If you don't mind exploring more, if not, totally cool. Um... So far, really interesting, hard because of the events, but thought-provoking. Some parts were a little harder to get through, but I'm glad I pushed through and read the first part. Damn, boy, what a journey of losing a book. For real, right? Moan at me because I'm watching this in class. Carrie, I don't want your teacher to get mad at me. <laughs> okay, sorry. Thank you, really. Um, it's because this kind of books opens the door on horrible things, and I do not think I'll be ever ready to face. Like, I understand the point of everything, but it still makes me uneasy. Um, I think that's one of the things in the book that Viktor Frankl talks about. We'll come back to that. I love the way it's written because of the flashbacks, but also as input from the writer years later. Remember, the whole book was compiled as a flashback. So it's him constantly thinking back, and then I think bringing us into a moment, and then pulling back out and analyzing. I think that's what I think the most interesting part of this book has been for me, was seeing that Viktor Frankl uses professional life in a way to kind of I think find meaning in this, which he did, and also um, understand it, analyze it. I think at times it, it kind of maybe gave him a freedom from this this suffering that he he endured. You know, um, the ability to acknowledge a bit of behavior and be like, "Wow, I can't believe I'm acting like this right now." When normally I would act like this. That's fascinating. What has and having all of these steps because of his background. I think that's actually super cool and I'm glad something like this came out. My honors English class was very ironic. We didn't read the second part though. Okay. Well, uh, Mads, uh, if it's cool, we would love for you to give more input. Um, I love when he starts to think about his wife. That's actually a very important thing. Just the line about love. Men can do, what is it? A man can do anything in love or through love, with love. The salvation of man is through love and in love. Cool quote. Um, some of the quotes in the book are so powerful. Yes. Well, happy belated birthday, Paula. Eye opening. Okay. It was challenged me to read in English. I literally had to read two page. Uh, times I understand the point of psychologist. Yes, I. But I'll say that even for me, reading in in English, there were some paragraphs I had to reread. Just to make sure I was like, that. yeah, that's what I want. Or, no, I don't know what this means. Um, I started writing my book with pen because I had no pencil and there were so many things to get me in this book that I maybe don't understand and find interesting. Hmm. Connection is very bad. Sorry. Uh, I'm on the train so I can't enjoy it. Okay. I would love to read that book, but I can't find... I particularly love the idea of the delusion of reprieve because it's so relatable in everyday life. You know, that's one thing that I thought was super cool about reading this book. Was I feel that at times, you know, you look at your own life and your own suffering and, and the small little bits you may have had. I mean, especially in comparison to this experience in here. And you see that, like... You're like, wow, why am I complaining? Why, why did this ever bother me? Why did, how did I let that get to me when, um, you know, all of these other things were happening to all these other people? But at the same time, I think, I, I'm pretty sure he says it at the end. I don't know why. I, maybe I vaguely remember reading that last night when I was, like, falling asleep. But the idea that everyone's suffering has meaning for them. And looking at how they were able to survive and get through this grand suffering helps the everyday pitfalls, the everyday little things that disappoint us or annoy us or test us. It makes that, I think, I don't want to say easier to cope with because I don't want to minimize anyone's suffering. But I, I do want to say it makes it, it gives you like a path of like, well, I've seen someone do these things, so I guess I can do that too. 
I think that's been pretty cool. Um, yeah, and the, the delusion of reprieve. In school in Germany, I think we got desensitized to a lot of these things. Like, we aren't as touchy about it as you think. That's cool. Can you explain that more? Um... What I find really interesting is how he analyzes everything. Like the lack of emotion, it's really unsettling. Well, I, I think that's actually why he was able to analyze that. Because he, he had the professional scientific detachment. He had that point of view that he had probably used in life before. And then was able to kind of access during this situation. But he does talk about it. He doesn't get... There are moments where he speaks of his moments of weakness or... Uh, moments where he felt that he was acting like the standard, the typical inmate. He does, he does bring that up. I think his profession or his ability to analyze things did save him from that sometimes. Oh. I hear Bella. Bella's my dog. And yes, uh, Jared Lee, I am doing Movember. Thank you for noticing. Um, totally different title in Italian. It's called Un Psicologo Nei Lager. But it's not the same. I don't know if I said that right. It's not the same version because that book is only the first part. Oh, wow. Okay. So no one has a second part? Am I the only one that has? No, people that have this copy will probably have a second part. Um, I think it's interesting perspective because you can understand the different stages of being inside of the camps and how most react. Also, the thing is that we are familiar with this topic because of history. For me, it's not like the story of the book itself, but the different point of view that matters. I would agree 100%. I like that... He refrains from telling us some of the more gory details, some of the more truly awful things, because he's like, those things have been written about. Those things have been talked about. You can go see movies about those things. Go do that if that's what you're looking for. This is purely an account through his eyes and his lens of what he believed was necessary to survive. And I, I think one of the coolest things about that was fate. Those stories always got to me. Like when the guys were like, we're going to run to the next town and that's going to help us out. But then that's where they ended up. To me, that was really cool. How, how much of, how it was a balance though. There were times when he let fate take his hand and there were times when he was like, no, I'm going to stay with my patients here and not go. And because of that, he was saved. You know, I, I not about the book, but what did you get for breakfast? My mom brought me coffee, orange juice, and, um. I'll eat those later. <laughs> My grandpa was a prisoner in Russia for many years when all family believed him dead. Whoa, this is a really cool story. Um, so your grandfather was a Nazi and was captured by the Russians or was in a Russian like prisoner of war camp? And then how long was it before he came back? This is fascinating. Discover the way we understand humanity in the face of suffering. I'm really exciting. Excited to discover the way we understand humanity in the face of suffering in this book. This book was so different from what I usually read and wouldn't read it without this book club. I loved it. It was great to read a book with this kind of point of view on the life of a concentration camp. German Nazi being prisoner in Russia. Cool. Um, are you tired? Again, I'm always tired. Tired is a, is a standard medium of life. <laughs> um... I think it's great that he talks about the horrors of concentration camp, but takes it one step further and explores the emotions and coping struggles. I, I, I agree. I think it's cool that he looks emotions, coping struggles, and then he also looks at different strategies he's seen people employ. He looks at a strategy that's that's working for him or that doesn't. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. This, rem this writing reminds me of Life of Pi because they both write, uh, in a matter of fact, both writing, in a matter of fact, was about their experiences. Yeah, they're both writing in a well, it's very scientific perspective in that way. Like, remember, he did study science and was always someone that loved science. So for him to analytically look at things from that perspective is very true to the same thing with him. Um... It's okay if you read 20 pages. You could, uh, this book isn't very, uh, it's not like a story where part of the story will get spoiled. 
you might have a few quotes that you'll miss or parts of the book that are cool, but it's not like you're missing a part of the story. So it's okay. You can just, in, you know, dive in when you feel like you can. Um, this book is really interesting. By reading The Diary of a Young Girl, we know what she's felt in a more subjective way with this book in a more ob objective way. Well, I think we're just getting a clearer picture at the different perspectives. You know, we get one from a girl who was hiding in a, an attic with her family, who happened to be 13. So that perspective is extremely different from... At the time, I believe he was, um, he was born in 1905, so he was 40 years old, 40-year-old established psychiatrist. And we got to see what, and then the intensity of that experience, what that was. They both were intense, they both had their own, but it was, it's helping shape this picture of what that time must have been like, and I think that's pretty cool. The part on apathy was very interesting. Jordan, would you mind going into what you thought was interesting about it, something that struck you? Because that would be great. I just found a book that I gave my dad on his desk. I don't sit on his desk. It's pretty cool. Um, author friend that made him cope with everything, even when he couldn't understand that kind of shit. True. True. The time of the book, though. And before he talks about something, then the topic totally changes. And that's also why I had some Slaughterhouse Five. Yes, because well, he goes back and forth. He's like, well, you know, five years ago, actually. But then actually, when I was in the camp on this day. Um, now, I did look this up. You will find some criticisms of the book. People thinking that the perspective was skewed or also kind of fed into things that were being taught in Germany before the Holocaust. So we can't. That's one thing. It, it's. And awesome. I really like this book. I thought it was awesome. But we have to also look at the other side and see what the criticisms of it were, which I'm planning on talking about more after we read more about logotherapy and, you know. Cool. Love the first part, the narration. Put the camp in. Wow, I think it's really deep. It's an inner point of view. I agree. I think that reading this book that connects with the past history is really important. I think that reading books that connect us with past history is really important. It's also a chance for us not to forget, not even for a minute, what men can do. That's what always surprises me when reading stuff like this. And I'm glad he acknowledges it in the book. He says, um, one of the questions I often get is how human beings can treat other human beings in such a way. Um, if I'm right... Okay, so the cool thing is, if you look at the history of like psychology and stuff too, this book came out in 19... Oh man, I should have saved that page. <laughs> Give me one sec. 1946, this book came out. Un you know, it, it, the whole story of how it came out was super cool. It came out, originally he wanted to write it anonymously, but then he realized that it would lose a lot of his power if he did so. But this was meant to just be an account for him. So this came out in 1946. Other studies have been done because of what we learned happened in this war because of accounts like this. You know, there's the Stanford prison experiment where there, uh, 1971 social psychology experiment that attempted to investigate the psychological effects of perceived power, focusing on the struggle between prisoners and prison officers. Um, so yeah, these all of these books bring us to an understanding of what the capabilities are on both sides. The moments of tremendous human connection and love, like when he said that guard gave him a whole loaf, or like a piece of bread, and he was brought to tears by the act of humanity that that was. Also to the same guard that was truly sadistic, horrible person, you know, both sides are present. I think it's a complete different perspective since he knows how since he knows so much about the human mind and explains how humans could normally react in such circumstances. It, it's fascinating. It's like a, a layered perspective. He's like, well, this person behaved like this, when generally humans tend to behave like this. I agree. I, that's why I think this book is cool, but there are certain things in here that I think are powerful that we can take with us. What lessons can we learn? Being from Germany, I think books like this are so important, and I think it's sad and people don't want to talk about these things because it's too sad. We all need to because we cannot forget ever. I agree 
in French and we can't find the French PDF and I can't buy it now, so I'm reading it in English and it's difficult but interesting. I bet. I could not imagine trying to read it in French. So, congratulations to you. For the life of me, I cannot find an actual copy of the book, but I found a PDF file, so hopefully I'll get to continue the book. I hope so, too. Um, this book makes you wonder if you'd be a survivor or one of them that gives up. Well, uh, Victor Frankl talks about it, didn't he? He says it, I think, in the very beginning. The best of us didn't make it. The worst of us may have. You know, it, it was all fate at some point. It was just... You happen to get on that truck and not that truck. You, they happen to say, you know. And, and that's one thing that was a constant theme, I think, is this idea of fate having an element in our life. A completely different perspective since you know so much about the human mind and seeing a first-hand experience, it makes me raw and interesting. Hmm. And that's something that I think was uh, makes you wonder what people do in order to cope with these situations. Uh, JJ Babes. To me, that's something I thought was cool that he started to talk about towards the end. If you guys didn't finish the reading, towards the end of it, he started talking about, okay, what was it like when we finished? Freedom was this, you know, thing they all desired and, and, and searched for that for so long and had become kind of numb to that when it finally did come... They didn't quite know how to accept it, understand it, take it in. Crazy, right? People, th I fear I'd get up early. Well, maybe now that you read this book, you won't. I come in contact with this topic, Germany, Jews, and humanity. I always feel scared because I remember the experiments of Milgram and Zimbardo chilling, and not in a good way. Hmm. We elaborate for everyone in the book club. Um... I had my coffee. I actually had a huge cup of coffee. Stella's actually with Dom in Los Angeles with Dom and Raja. She's not here today. Well, in schools in Germany, we just talk about it a lot. We speak about how it was by no means all Germans, and they weren't all evil. Often they just had to follow, and it was you or them. <laughs> but that is another thing in humanity. You or them. You know, that, that uh, interesting. That's super cool. I, see, that's something that... I'm trying to think, well, what did, how did we learn about it in school? I don't think we learn about a lot of things adequately. We learn about a lot of things, I think, very surface. And then if you want to explore, you have to go do that self-education. And I think that's one of the things why art is very important, because that's how people tend to learn things about things, you know, films, movies, books, essays, paintings. You can look at a painting and be like, when was that painted? Why did they paint that? And then you can find this whole story out about it. Cool. Um... I feel like people in these camps weren't treated as actual people, but as numbers, things, and I'm not quite upset because it's quite disturbing because some things are so like that. Well, <clears throat> that was one of the ways in which to take humanity away, take away your name, take away your anything that distinguished an individuality, your hair, put you all in a uniform and give you all numbers. It was very uh, calculated. Yes, the German version has a play as the second part. No way. Do you know what... Can you send me the name of that play? I would like to see if I can find it in English. The Italians don't have it. Also, it's a lot of stuff that are not in the original version, and I have no idea where the translator took that stuff from, so I read the English PDF. Oh my gosh. It hit me hardest when the one guy started crying when his shoes fell apart. I just wanted to cry myself. I like the way he tries to explain why the prison guards did what they did and how there was prison guards that were less cruel, if you know what I mean. Austining. Yes. 
Well, I think it's interesting that he gave multiple perspectives for that. He was like, there were some prisoners that were literally just pieces of shit. And then there were some prisoners that were a little more connected. I think it's fascinating when he talks about the prisoners who were actually part of the community, but were given this exalted position that behaved most cruelly. But I think, I don't know, I remember I learned about the Stanford prison experiment when I was a kid. When I was a kid, when I was in high school, I took psychology, we talked about it. I don't remember if that happened, if they did that, if they had someone be a prisoner for a bit and then made them a guard, and then how that changed their psychology. But, fascinating. <laughs> what kind of dog is Bella? Bella is a giant German shepherd. I will post a picture of her later. <laughs> And yes, it does rhyme with Stella. I didn't realize that when I named Stella Stella. But it happens. I do think it's a more raw and accurate version since he's a doctor and wants the reader to know what really happened there. No filter, all in the open. You know, and that's interesting. I agree. I, that's why I wanted to read this book again. <laughs> I read like 50 pages. But I wanted to finish it because um, <clears throat> it's not a perspective you often get. Um, yeah. I like the last part of it best. I think he talks about life after being freed from the camp. Most people only talk about what happened before, during. Not the aftermath. That's what I agree. The aftermath is the part that I'm like, wait, I've, I've read about the beginning. I've, I've watched movies about the middle. And I've seen things way in the future. But what about right after the days? The title of the book and finish is Border of Humanity. That's pretty cool. I bet it's a coping mechanism to be like, I have to look at this scientifically, so I'm going to distance myself. Although I wonder how, how often he was doing it in the moment and how much of it was examining small little bits. What's interested me the most is how he used his trauma and experience to help other people, especially those who felt like they had nothing left to live for. Frankel's approach is better than Freud's. Phoenix Aurora, would you mind talking about Freud's perspective? Just so I can read it for everyone in the book club. But yeah, very cool. Can you imagine living without freedom? I can't. I found so intense when he talks about names. Or better the lack of them. And how they were stripped of everything. It makes me so mad about people negating what has happened in those times. Or details on the physical states of people are living in. Criticism, yes, but we cannot fault people for being a product of their time. No. And that's one thing he talked about. Didn't he mention about nature versus nurture versus environment? Like, how did this happen? There's a passage. At such moment, it is not the physical pain which hurts the most. It is the mental agony caused by injustice, the unreasonableness. Whoa, I'm really far behind, guys. I'm going to... Oh, oh, my goodness. I fell really far behind. Okay. Oh, man. figured out the password on the computer. <laughs> um, he did analyze scientifically in the moment too because he said once, he only remembers that one moment when the guy died because he felt nothing and he wondered about it. Interesting. I'm, I'm caught up now. I'm all the way at the bottom. So let's, um, 
So I think from a general consensus of what I've read and what I've, what we've all, kind of been saying is that it was fascinating to read this book because of the singular perspective it provided us into this world where we all had other perspectives and other understandings that kind of allowed us to go a little deeper into that. Also the perspective of someone analyzing this, able to detach themselves in a way because of that need for analysis. It was really cool to see someone who lived it, who was in it. Um, and read that. Also the insights he was able to give us about life, meaning, suffering, having meaning in life. Um, I think it's fascinating. I think a lot of the times, especially in our day and age, we get very caught up with little things, things that bother us. And it's hard to get, you know, it's hard to get perspective. I think that's why I wanted to read this book because, you know, it's very easy to complain about things. It's very easy to be upset about things. I complain about things all the time. But it's cool to have books like this, moments like this, things like this that can kind of recenter you and ground you in your reality. Okay, I'm missing the comments about my mustache. <laughs> Albustache. Oh boy. I think this book is a different way to see the concentration camp. Not better or worse, just a different point of view without minimizing the cruelty and atrocity those people had to go through. I'm going back up now. These kind of battle between prisoners reminded me of 1984 and Lord of the Fies. In the face of pain, there are no heroes. Also, when he says there are just two types of people in the concentration camp, the prisoners and the capos. I thought about the boys on the island and the Lord of the Flies. I mean, on the island, even the most innocent boy became a wild and unhuman person. I wonder who just got here. Hmm. You spell gas with two S's. Yeah. Two S's. Let's get into quotes. Let's get into quotes. <clears throat> the dog scared me. Yeah, she's a big dog. It would scare most people, but she's literally a, a sweetheart little... Squish her face. But she's big and looks scary, which is kind of awesome, because she's really just... Isolation must have been a big thing. Sometimes it could have been both strength and a weakness. I think the lack of privacy that caused the feeling of isolation really would have gotten to me. The idea that you're constantly surrounded by people, but you can't be alone. But you're so alone in your own suffering and life and trials that you can't really connect to people. This, To me, that would have been one of the most difficult things. So let's talk about quotes. Let's talk about quotes. What favorite quotes do you have? I have one section that I know I wanted to read. I actually remember the page number because of how cool I thought it was. Now we're gonna look back and be like, was I just tired? <laughs> um, I'm gonna read it to you guys. We who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing. The last of the human freedoms. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. To choose one's own way. And there were always choices to make every day. Every hour offered the opportunity to make a decision. A decision which determined whether you would 
or would not submit to those powers which threaten to rob you of your very self, your inner freedom, which determined whether or not you would become the plaything of circumstance, renouncing freedom and dignity to become molded into the form of the typical inmate. I think that was one of the most powerful things because that's what I get from this book. At any point in time, it's also an echo of what my grandfather told me in this book. I'll tell you guys later. Uh, okay, ready? Going back. Okay, here we go. Emotion, which is suffering, ceases to be suffering as soon as we form a clear and precise picture of it. Awesome. Sounds of whipping, leather beating down on naked bodies. My brain physically hurt that. I heard that as well. Also, I think of... Um, I forgot what movie it was, whether it was Schindler's List or um, Boy in Striped Pajamas or The Pianist, where there is that scene where the people are in the showers and they're worried that it's the gas chambers and then water does come out and that sense of elation. Crazy. I thought of that moment because of that. He who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. Yes. In some ways, suffering ceases to be suffering the moment it finds meaning, such as the meaning of sacrifice. Yet, it is possible to practice the art of living even in a concentration, even in a concentration camp, although suffering is omnipresent. No man should judge unless he asks himself in absolute honesty whether a similar situation he might not have done the same thing. Yes, a man can get used to anything, but do not ask us how. That is an echo of Handmaid's Tale. Normality is only what continues to happen. Anything can become normal. That's why we must question and fight against what we don't want to become normal. I think that's a stance we have to take. You know, okay, we agree with this, don't agree with this. This we, we can't allow to become normal. And I think we're seeing that a lot in my country right now. Just what do we want to call normality? What do we want to fight for? No dream, no matter how horrible, could be as bad as the reality of the camp which surrounded us and which, and to which I was about to recall him. How sad was that? This guy was having a night terror. And he was like, I'd rather let him sleep in that terror because this is just way worse. We can see the actor in you when you're reading these quotes. <laughs> Every man was controlled by one thought only, to keep himself alive for the family waiting for him at home and to save his friends. I like how they would take time to share little things like a beautiful sunset to show that there's still beauty in the world. That is something that I, would, I loved when he talked about sitting on, sitting on the little hatch outside of the hut he was helping patients at and he looked across the fields of Bavaria. I love that moment. There was only one thing that I dread, not to be worthy of my sufferings. That's in Schindler's List. Okay, thank you, Tiffy. Um, thank you, Albert. I really need to go. See you next week. Oh, have a great week. Um, set me like a seal upon thy heart. Love is as strong as death. When thinking of his wife. Yes. Love goes far beyond the physical person of the beloved. It finds its deepest meaning in the spiritual being, his inner self. Whether or not he is actually present, whether or not he is actually alive at all, ceases somehow to be of importance. I relate to a lot of the isolation thing. I have terrible, so much anxiety. So when I'm walking in hallways, going to classes, it's kind of like I'm surrounded by people, but I'm alone. I don't see faces. An abnormal reaction to a normal behavior. <laughs> An abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. We were grateful for the smallest mercies. Extraño esos momentos en los que Alberto hablaba en español sobre la tema. Bueno. Ahora estoy aquí en North Carolina con mi familia y voy a tener que hablar más español, entonces debería hablar más aquí. Este libro fue algo impresionante para mí. Um, si, si ustedes quieren hablar en español sobre los comentos, comentos, sigue y yo los puedo responder en español y los puedo leer para todos que hablan español. No, I want to drink orange juice. Sorry. Life in a country tore open the human soul and exposed its depths. 
It is surprising that in those depths we again found only human qualities, which in their very nature were a mixture of good and evil. Do you think there's a reason why the book doesn't really have characters' names? Yes. I don't think he wants to speak for anyone else. I don't think he wants judgment to be placed upon someone. I think he wanted to give a completely singular experience. So the names were not important. I think he, that's what I think. Also, I don't think he wanted to subject other people's experience into a book that he was writing for their own feelings of comfort or understanding or how they wanted to deal with this experience. They might not want it in a book that people could read about for the next hundred years. You know, he wants, I think he gave them privacy. He gave them their freedom. He gave them their respect. Comentarios, gracias. <laughs> Sería mucho hablar en español. I understood how a man who has nothing left in this world still may know bliss, be it only for a brief moment in the contemplation of his beloved. Ahora te voy a escribir en español. Ya verás. Perfect. Um, <laughs> comentarios, yeah, that's funny. Uh, I had intended to write this book anonymously using my prisoner number only, but when the manuscript was completed, I saw that as an anonymous publication, it would lose half its value, and that I must have the courage to state my convictions openly. Me gustaría escucharte hablar en español, aunque también me sirve escucharte en inglés para aprender más. Entonces, sí, seguimos practicando los dos. I actually haven't read the book. But just reading these quotes and hearing all about it makes me want to read it. Too bad I couldn't find it anywhere. Well, you should check out Rosenda Reads PDFs to see if Rita was able to put the PDF somewhere online. If not, the first part of the book you might find in most languages, I would say. It's been, tra it's been translated into quite a few. Si no has encontrado el, el libro en el internet, tienes que buscarlo porque yo creo que si, si está el PDF, por lo menos ahí está. ¿Cómo se puede imaginar un mundo sino la libertad que nosotros necesitamos? También yo pienso que en este libro hay muchos temas para pensar a lo que pasó. Claro, muchas cosas pasó para que esta guerra empezaba, para que estas personas tenían que hacer estas cosas. Y tenemos que aprender de ese tiempo, de esas personas, y tenemos que seguir hablando de sus historias. You cannot control what happens to you in your life, but you can always control what you will feel and do about what happens to you. That, Camille, thank you. That's that's the whole point. I wanted. That's why I liked this book because that message becomes very clear. The Latin word finis has two meanings: the end or the finish, and a goal to reach. I had wanted simply to convey that a reader, by the way, of concrete... Camille, you're crushing the quotes today. I wanted simply to convey the reader by way of concrete example that life holds a potential meaning under the conditions, even the most miserable ones. I had trouble finding this book at the store. It ended up being in the psychology section. Yes. <laughs> um, the truth... That love is the ultimate in the highest goal which was, to which a man can aspire. I recommend the book called A World Apart, A Memoir of the Gulag by Gustav Herling Gudzinski. It's a very moving and shocking book. Okay? If you could tweet that to me so I can write it down. Um, let me look through real quick and see if there's anything else I wanted to read to you guys. There's one paragraph I want to read if that's cool. Once the meaning of suffering had been revealed to us, we refused to minimalize or alleviate the camp's tortures by ignoring them or harboring false illusions and entertaining artificial optimism. 
Suffering had become a task on which we did not want to turn our backs. We realized its hidden opportunities for achievement, the opportunities which caused the poem Rilke, uh, Rilke to write, how much suffering there is to get through. Rilke spoke of getting through suffering, as others would talk of getting through work. There was plenty of suffering for us to get through. Therefore, it was necessary to face up to the full amount of suffering, trying to keep moments of weakness and furtive tears to a minimum. But there was no need to be ashamed of tears, for tears bore witness that a man had the greatest of courage, the courage to suffer. Only very few realized that. Shamefacedly, some confessed occasionally that they had wept like the comrade who answered my question of how he had gotten over his edema. By confessing, I have wept it out of my system. Courage to suffer. Yes. Um, lesson 15. We're actually going to leave a little early today because my whole family's here. I hope you guys don't mind. This book was a shorter book. Um, so we're going to read part two. For those of you that don't have part two, I honestly don't know what to do. Give me a couple days to think about it. Um, they're different essays. Logotherapy in a nutshell. The will to meaning. Uh, existential frustration. Neugenic neuroses. Uh, Neurodynamic uh, something. The existential vacuum. Meaning of life. The essence of existence. So maybe I'll put these pictures up there. Because they're not a lot. They're essentially just small essays. And then there's a, pros a postscript from 1984, The Case for a Tragic Optimism. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the titles of each of these, and maybe you can find them like that. If your book has them, awesome. Um, yeah. But we're going to finish the book for the next time. Um, I think we'll talk... I think we'll talk soon. I think we'll talk. See, I'm, I'm here for a bit. Tessa gets here tomorrow. I'm still here on Sunday, and then Monday I go home. Let's talk Tuesday. Let's talk Tuesday. Um, Tuesday will give us a little more freedom. Um, and now I kind of want to walk you through the library really quickly, if that's cool. This is my dad's library. A lot of these books are his. My dad was a very, very, very big reader when I was a kid. He still reads a lot. Um, actually, some of my books are here from high school. So we have, like, all these military books. Once an Eagle by Anton Meyer. That book's one of my favorites. I haven't finished it yet. Because it's so big, but it's so good. I want to. Right. You can see these are all mine. Oh, I heard my dad's name. I guess he's home. Those are mine. A lot of these are mine. See, look. Count of Monte Cristo. Cool, right? Very cool. That's actually my copy of Obama's Wars. I love that I have my, uh, <laughs> my little library here. Um, I'm going to show a picture of my grandfather, a great mustachioed man. With my dad, I think that's the day that he became an officer in the military. Oh, this is when my dad got back from Iraq. All right. Yeah. And look, this is Diego getting his college diploma. He might not like that I'm sharing this. <laughs> All right, guys. Oh, wait. That's Bella. Let's look. Hold on. 
Bela! Okay, um minuto, um minuto. All right. Thank you guys so much. I will see you next week. I'll post about that. I'll post a picture of Bella. I'll take care of it all. Let's see. Is she coming? Is she coming? Oh. Bella, come here. Come here. There she is. Hi. Ah, she's a big one, isn't she? And look at this. My parents have a, a poster from the best... People's Choice Show of 2018. Isn't that pretty cool? <laughs> All right, guys. I will see you later. I'm going to go say hi to my family. Remember, keep exploring, keep questioning, keep being curious, and keep being positive forces of change in your environment. If you find any books you want to read, you find any books at home, let us know, and I will get back to you about what we read this coming week. But just finish it. Finish the book, and we'll talk about it. Right now, I'm going to hang out with Bella.